Hello friends and welcome on into Soccer North. Can I tell you how I'm feeling? Can we get real with one another? I'm dizzy, I'm conflicted, I'm proud, I'm hopeful, I'm exhausted. This whole experience was like booking a trip to Disneyland. The anticipation of the trip raising our excitement level. We get there, the first ride's amazing, the second ride makes us sick, and the final ride does nothing for us. It's time to go home. The Canadian men are going home. The World Cup though, it goes on, and now we're left to dissect what happened and try to predict what lies ahead. Not just for the men, but for the women as well. And I have some great voices joining me today to do just that. Joshua Cloak wrote a great article in The Athletic reflecting on Canada's performance both on and off the pitch and the moves he feels need to be made heading into the next World Cup cycle. Sports host Brendan Dunlop was at every Canadian match and even did the in-house player announcements. And two-time Olympic medalist Diana Matheson wasted no time giving back to the sport after retiring. Did someone say women's domestic league? The Maple Leaf may not be in Qatar anymore, but that big red beauty is still making moves across the globe. What are they doing? Thought you'd never ask. Here's Keeping Up With The Canadians. We begin in Italy. Vancouver, BC's Julia Grosso scored her first goal in a Juventus jersey, and her performance earned her Team of the Week honors for a third time in Italy's top flight this season. We had her on Soccer North to discuss the emotions of finally getting her first goal. And I was just very, like, startled. Like, I was just like, finally, like, oh my god. Like, it was just kind of one of those. But now, moving forward, I will have a celebration. Jesse Fleming saw her fellow midfielder's goal and said, I'll raise you. The Chelsea player netted a brace, her first goals of the season, in an 8-0 drubbing over Leicester City. The victory marked Chelsea's sixth straight win, and they now sit at the top of the women's Super League table. A big shout out goes out to Ashley Lawrence. She played in her 100th cap in the French First Division for French Giants Paris Saint-Germain in a 1-0 victory over crosstown rivals Paris FC. Canadian striker Chloe Lacasse is staying hot with her club Benfica in the Portuguese First Division. She scored in a 3-0 victory over Braga. Benfica is undefeated in league action, sitting in first place at the table. And Lacasse now has 11 goals in 14 games in all competition. Another Canadian forward was leading her team to victory. Clarissa Laracy scored for Celtic FC in the third minute, as they would eventually go on to defeat Dundee by a score of 5-0. And Canadians are invading Scotland. Joining Laracy and Celtic Green will be Canadian defender Alistair Johnston. This week, it was announced he'll officially be joining the Scottish side from MLS team CF Montreal. And these are the moves you want to see Canadian nationals making. It still blows my mind that just three years ago, he was playing in League One Ontario. And speaking of meteoric rises, Ismail Kone just has one year of professional soccer under his belt, with CF Montreal as well, but he's shown enough promise to book his ticket to England. The midfielder is joining Watford of the Championship, one division below the Premier League, and it's reported to be for a club record transfer fee. CF Montreal was the only Canadian MLS team to make the playoffs this year, and now they're getting picked apart. Ismail Kone and Alistair Johnston joined former teammate Georgi Mihalovic in leaving the team, the latter playing in the Netherlands now. And even their coach, Wilfred Nancy, has moved on to become the new manager of the Columbus Crew. Here on Soccer North from the Athletic, Joshua Cloak, who just spent three and a half weeks in Qatar covering the World Cup, and in particular, covering the Canadian men. Welcome to the show, Josh. You know, you wrote a great postmortem piece in The Athletic, so we're going to get into that both on and off the pitch. Let's begin on the pitch in particular. Do you feel John Herdman needs to be ruthless moving forward with player personnel in order to have a different story come 2026? Definitely. And I think John Herdman did really well throughout qualifying to be loyal to the people that helped get Canada, not just to the World Cup through this last qualifying cycle, but had been with the men's program for so long. But ultimately, I think the spine of this team really needs to change. Um, and there's three players in particular that I think, um, A, have done an incredible service to the Canadian men's national team, but B, and two things can be true here, you know, might need to move on in, in favor of some younger, fresher faces. Um, Atiba Hutchinson is still arguably the best, you know, men's player in Canadian history. But I think against Croatia, his lack of foot speed was exposed. And I think it's probably time to turn over the keys in the midfield to Ismail Kone, 
I think Steve Vittoria, you know, at his age as well, again, we're talking about players over 30. We're in a world in modern football where center backs have to be fast on the ball. And he got exposed a few times for lack of foot speed. And then moving even further back, Milan Borjan. I mean, I think we all saw the blunder against Morocco. And it's not because of that blunder alone, but I see two great younger goalkeepers um, Dane Sinclair in particular and Mac Kripo, who are more than capable, I think, of, of starting right now. And I just think if you want to compete in 2026, you have to be all in on speed, 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 because that's the way the game is trending. So that's why I think the spine of this team really needs to change. What were the comments around John Herdman? I mean, he was entering as one of these coaches with a, a reputation of being tactically sound. But I, again, I'm curious to know what people were saying about John Herdman in particular as a manager. Well, again, and I know we've already brought it up. I think the comments after Croatia are something that um, John certainly wishes he hadn't said. And I think if you talk to some experienced journalists, which I did, they all felt that that's something that, that doesn't need to be said. You don't need to give a team like Croatia any extra ammunition. This is a team that already felt like underdogs you remember at the last World Cup when they were up against England who were claiming it was coming home. Sometimes I wonder if this Canadian team was a little bit too focused on what they had to do and a little less focused on how other teams would attack them, right? They came out against Belgium and they dominated play, they dictated play. It was very surprising and borderline concerning to me um, that Canada would roll out a two-man midfield against Croatia who have one of the best three-man midfields you know, in global, in international soccer right now. So that's, you know, the perception of, of this Canadian team, I will say, wildly changed over the span of, of a week. They were darlings coming into the tournament. They were darlings after Belgium. And the rug got pulled out from this team, you know, very, very quickly. Let's go off the pitch now, and I don't need to tell you the stories because you were over there living them from, you know, Canada being late to their first press conference to... Uh, journalists being upset of the lack of player availability, in particular, the face, the superstar, and Alfonso Davies. What was that experience like for you? We know Canada soccer has been to the Olympics with the women. They've been to the World Cup with the women. How did they do on the men's side? On one hand, I understand it, right? The, the comparison I made is, is it felt to me like Canada soccer was showing up to their first day at work and their first job out of university, right? You have all the right intentions, but you get there and you realize this is a completely different beast. Um, I had the opportunity to go to training sessions. I, I went to a Japanese training session and 12 players were made available to the media after through mix zones. And with Canada Soccer, you would get maybe two players. Uh, the media had very little input on, on you know which players were made available. Sometimes it was players that hadn't played in the tournament yet. And it didn't feel like Canada soccer was as interested in, I guess, helping us tell stories because the stories within this national team are vast. There's, there's players that come from incredibly different backgrounds, players that come from difficult backgrounds. And we wanted to tell those stories, but it felt like, you know, access was limited. Um, and it just felt like there's a lot to learn from some clearly world-class football organizations. I mentioned Japan. The United States, which we should be comparing ourselves to as a, as a quote unquote soccer nation a lot, the organization they showed in making players available before the tournament, we wanted to help tell stories. Um, and it felt like uh, that, that interest in telling stories wasn't necessarily reciprocal, if that makes sense. I understand you because here at CBC, we have this saying, come the Olympics, we don't want you meeting an athlete for the first time when they're on the podium. We want you to know their story in the four years in between because it is about storytelling it's about bridging that gap and it's about creating that connection with fans who may not know who these athletes are to begin with they just tune in once every four years to the world cup but now throughout the years throughout the cycle they will get to know them so i get that i get everything you're saying i loved your article welcome back home and really appreciate you Thank taking you. the time here on soccer north oh thanks so much andy Co-founder of Canada Soccer Daily is our boy, Brendan Dunlop, joining us here on Soccer North. Welcome back home, my friend. You were in Qatar. Did they look different to you uh, from qualifying, playing against CONCACAF teams, or did they look like the same team that just ran up against some pretty tough European competition? 
I tell you, they they really did look like a team that belonged, right? And I think that was the biggest concern that everybody had, having not had the experience to go up against sides that were not CONCACAF opposition. But they went toe-to-toe -to -toe with every one of them for parts of that game. You know, for nearly half an hour against Croatia, they looked pretty darn good and, and were arguably the better side for 26 minutes against Croatia. Obviously, we can forget the second half and how the rest of that game played out. But against Morocco, they were phenomenal in that second half. Um, I think they, they have a lot to be proud of. You know, before this this World Cup, I had this weird feeling that they could either get four points in Qatar and have a chance of coming out of the group, or they were going to get zero. I didn't see any other option. So I'm sad that I was right on the zero part. But the way that they played, every single person that watched them play, no matter where they were from, no matter their experience in watching Canada before, was impressed by Canada and is hopeful for the future because the future really is bright, right? Curious to to hear your expectations. We know the Gold Cup is, is coming up in 2023. There's talk of them being part of Copa America in 2024. As much as it would be great to see them win that, and that would still be my expectation, do you predict, though, that there could be growing pains because maybe they are going to try some new faces, they are going to try some new players because that's what you need to do to evolve and move forward? There will be growing pains. I still think that come 26, though, when the World Cup is co-hosted here, that the progression will put them on a higher point, that the trajectory will continue to push them forward. But there's going to be plenty of new faces, and I think the biggest one's going to be the manager. That's my gut. I know John Herdman says he wants to be here in 26. I just don't understand how there's not a slew of clubs making offers over the next few years that maybe swoon him away. And as we've seen already with Canada's players, um, that's just going to continue. So I do feel like come 24, come 26, there's going to be another Ishmael Kone type that we're talking about. That's the real exciting part, right, for any Canadian mm -hmm. fan. You look at this core that went to Qatar and came away with zero points. How many of them are going to be in their prime and even better a few years from now, not to mention the players that we don't know yet that will rise into the ranks and fill some of those other places? I always like asking people who were there what global media was saying, because we can be in our own little space here in Canada. What was what was the impression they left behind with global fans, global media? What was the talk around Canada? I spent a lot of time with Belgian media, and before that game, every single Belgian person I met said that Canada was the team they were most afraid of in that group, without a doubt. And to me, that spoke volumes. And you saw the way that they played, and yes, to concede uh, the first half goal for Fonzie to have the, the penalty stop. For us Canadians, it just felt like, Ugh. Canada soccer here again. We've, we've seen this kind of nightmare, agonized with this for, for so long. But everyone was impressed by how they played, by how they were not just Alfonso Davies and 10 Canadians. Um, mm -hmm. I th really think that they did themselves a, a world of good. Um, and you're seeing it by some of the moves that I think were in the works beforehand, certainly Alistair Johnson. But there will be a lot of, of teams picking up the phone to uh, ask about Canadian players, if not actually put in official bids for them. And that is something that we haven't had in this country before. I can't let you go, though, without asking you what it was like to be the in-house player announcer. You announced the players. Speaking of Alfonso Davies, you're the one who announced that historic goal in the stadium. What was that experience like? Yeah, that was crazy. I, uh, To be honest, I didn't know that that was quite going to be the situation when uh, I took the position to be what was designated as a fan MC and to be able to call out that starting 11 that first game against Belgium. I don't think I'll ever be able to replicate that feeling again. The uh, There may have been 5,000 Canadian fans in the corner behind me. It felt like 50,000. And they did the call out just the way they do it at BMO Field and in Canada. It was exceptional to, to be a part of and to see Fonzie score that goal right in front of me at eye level. Um, something funny about that ball hanging in the air from Tejan. I knew that it was going in. Uh, and to be the one to then pick up the microphone and yell, goal for Canada. That was, that was amazing. Those are memories that you tell your grandkids about. Brendan Dunlop, always appreciate you taking the time. Thanks very much. Anytime. Canada is the only top 10 FIFA ranked team to not have its own women's domestic league. Many players are forced to play overseas or across the border. Worse, many players are forced to retire early because options are limited. Their careers suffer, the national team suffers. But Olympic medalist and recently retired player Diana Matheson is doing something about it. For fans of the women's game, Christmas came early. Diana, you've been vocal for the last year saying that you've been working on a domestic league for women and it sounds like there's been some progress there. What is the announcement today? Yeah, we are announcing that we are building a women's professional soccer league in Canada. We're kicking off 2025 and it felt like after six months of work with myself and my business partner, Thomas Gilbert, that it was time to share that news with 
Canadians uh, share that we've got two founding teams of Vancouver Whitecaps and Calgary Foothills and two founding partners, two incredible founding partners in CIBC and Air Canada. That is excellent news. As you know, a lot of people have been craving a women's domestic league in soccer. Craving a women's domestic league across any sport in this country uh, is definitely lacking. So 2025 is the launch. You have the two founding teams right now. What is the goal as far as how many teams you would like in the league? Yeah, here's uh, here's what we're thinking. So kickoffs 2025, like I said, we've got two teams. The plan is to have eight teams across Canada, a truly Canadian league. Four in the east, four in the west, so we can have a bit of a conference format. And then the goal is to attract some of the world's best women's soccer players to Canada, including Canadian women's national team players. Uh, we know, you know, the women's game is only growing. We know CONCACAF Champions League is coming in the future in North America, and it's time to build our league and, and start to compete because this thing's only going to get bigger. Vancouver Whitecaps associated, obviously, with an MLS club. Is that the goal moving forward, those types of partners? Yeah, we're looking at just like the NWSL has done in, in its team ownership, we're looking at different types of ownership. So absolutely MLS clubs we're interested in. Uh, obviously the Vancouver Whitecaps are first in the door here. Uh, for me, Greg Kerfoot has been one of the people who's been supporting Canadian women's soccer behind the scenes for decades. And he, he probably doesn't even like me saying that, but that's a fact. He's been putting money into our national team program since the early aughts, he's, he's still putting money in. Um, so he was one of the first people I approached in this project because I knew he shares the same goals I do. And we'd love independent ownership too, independent ownership groups. We want women to be a part of our ownership groups. If you know, we're not building like NWSL did 10 years ago, we're building now. And that means we need more diverse ownership. That means women at the table to begin with. I have a theory that not many women in Canada have been asked if they want to own professional sports teams, and I would love to ask them. Yeah, why not? There we go. Let's put the ask out as we speak. And I know that it's it's two years away, but I know you're already working hard as well on the structure of it too. Um, you know, again, I look at just the Canadian Premier League because it's the only men's domestic league in the country right now, and I see how they structure things as far as the amount of Canadian players under 21s. Mm -hmm. How do the women work? How is that going to work as far as how you want to construct your squads? Yeah, so for us, we're looking at a maximum of seven international players per team, the remainder Canadian, obviously. And for us, that's a bit higher than NWSL to really supplement that playing quality of our league just in the first few years. And we do think Canada is a really attractive market for women's professional players, obviously, you know, in, incredible standard of living, incredible attitudes towards women in sports. So we want to attract really strong international talent here. Geography, we know Canada is a really big country. Mm -hmm. Are those some of the challenges too, when you just look at um, transportation? Yeah, we're big. Uh, <laughs> and that's the one thing everyone points at, you know, in how do we build sports leagues in Canada? We're really big. So for us, we've done two things. Number one, founding partner off the bat, Air Canada. They're really going to help us manage those costs and they're going to make sure our players are traveling in style. Uh, and two, we're going to have a bit of a mixed competition format. So one of the innovations that came out of COVID, uh, a silver lining, I guess, one of the things was that model of bringing all the teams to one market and having a hub competition. So mostly home and away, traditional season model, but twice per year. We'll bring all our teams to one market for 10 days where all our East Coast teams will play all our West Coast teams once. And we want to build out events and properties around those 10 days as well. So Hub Model and National Partner Air Canada are how we're addressing the, our, our vast <laughs> geography. We look forward to 2025. This is truly exciting news. That you've, you've put in a ton of hard work. You have the creds, you have the chops, and I know that it's going to go places successfully with you behind it. So congratulations on this announcement. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, and I, I mean, I appreciate you always. I mean, you're a part of this. Mm -hmm. I feel like this is this is something for all of us. Yeah. Like, there's one of the strengths in this is so many people, everyone I talk to is so excited for this and they want it to happen. And part of the reason around this announcement is we want people to know it's happening. We want people to know we're working on it because, you know, we're going to need the fan support. It's time to invest for team owners. We already know Corporate Canada is behind this, but... Mm -hmm. We know we're working on it, and we're going to be working on this for the next two years. So uh, reach out, because we're building it together. Well, he just gave us an early Christmas present. Thank well, you. Thanks. <laughs> this is really exciting, because sitting here in our Soccer North studio is the most streamed Irish artist on Apple this year, and that is Dermot Kennedy, who has an album coming out, Sonder. It is so great to have you here. How are you? 
I am excellent. How are you doing? Really good, thank you. How's Canada treating you? Great. It always is great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Without fail, it, I always have a good time when I'm here. Yeah. The World Cup is still going on. Sure. And I want to get some answers, and, and maybe I'll agree with you. Maybe I'll poke some, poke some fun a little bit more. Yeah. But um, who do you think is most likely to win the World Cup? Ireland, probably. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, really, really. Um, uh, who do I think? I don't know. Brazil are very good, right? They're very good, yeah. Yeah, I feel like they're very strong. They would be my favorites currently. Okay, so you're putting your support behind them? Yeah. Well, now, this is the thing, you kind of joked about that, but who are you cheering for when Ireland is not in the tournament? Oh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> whoever just, like, it's kind of puts you in a nice spot because you just enjoy every game. I mm -hmm. liked watching uh, the Netherlands the other day. Um... But no, there's no team that you would actively root for, no. You just enjoy the tournament yes. and you enjoy some good footy. Exactly. And that's what you want to watch. Okay. Who do you think is most likely to win the Golden Boot? Golden Boot? Mbappe, right? Yeah. I was about to, I, How I many does he have? What does Three he or have? Something? Yeah, I mean, he's like at four. I mean, I, I forgot to check the last tally yeah, there, yeah. but he's already leading the way. He's pretty incredible. Um, now, which song of yours yeah. do you think could maybe one day most likely be a World Cup anthem? Wow. Yeah, my Shakira moment. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, which song of mine currently? I don't know. I feel like Power Over Me would be a good shout. It's like okay. a, it feels like a sort of athletic type thing. Yeah. I do. I do like yeah. that a lot. All right. Well, I'm just curious if you still have some old cleats and if you are going to throw them. Oh, on I do. Yeah, yeah, I have a bunch of them in the wardrobe. Yeah, yeah. I get so sad when I see them. I'm like, oh man, different life. Yeah. Well, hopefully you do get out, find that yes. joy again. But I know you have that joy on stage. Um, so congratulations on the Thank new you. album. And we look forward to your visit in Toronto in June. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, Canada, our journey here on Soccer North is slowing down. Hold on. We're not going anywhere, especially not after that announcement by Diana. We'll continue to follow Canadian players and then ramp up around major tournaments. I hope you stay with us. And yeah, I know soccer can be such a cruel sport. The way it's set up, qualifying for a tournament lasts longer than the tournament itself, which means you get brought on an epic journey with your favorite team for over a year, and then in one week, it can all be over. Many of us are still decompressing and trying to make sense of the ride we were just on with the Canadian men. The moments they gave us during qualification are memories that will last a lifetime. Wins over the USA and Mexico, the giants of CONCACAF. The Davies goal against Panama, Laren becoming the leader in goals for the men, and Atakubi leaping into the snowbank in Edmonton. So much joy, but also so many questions. Where do they go from here and how do they improve? Canada is one of three hosts for the 2026 FIFA World Cup. Expectations will be different. And as the curtain falls on the men for now, the women take center stage. The 2023 World Cup will be held in Australia and New Zealand, and the Canadians enter as the Olympic champions. And on their team, they boast the world's all-time leader in goals, Christine St. Clair. Expectations are different for them, too. The role of St. Clair is changing. The presence of Jesse Fleming is growing. How will all of that translate next summer down under? We have questions for both the men and women. But one thing is certain. When the red and white take to the pitch, the country pays attention. We're captivated, we're invested, and we hope. This journey is far from over, Canada. We're going back to Disneyland, so get your tickets, buckle up, and enjoy the ride.